This is Reverend Sean David Coleman at Transformation Church, where Pastor Andrew V. Hunt Jr. is our leader. Uh, look, you can YouTube us, you can restream us, Can TV Channel 36. Don't touch that guy. Pastor Andrew D. Hunt Jr. Transformation Church. And uh, give it a shout out to um, Lady China. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi.
being so good and so merciful to us. There's a word from the Lord today. Just one verse. Galatians 5, verse 25. Galatians 5, verse 25. We're going to spend the next two weeks on holiness. Church will be around holy a whole lot. You don't seem to know what being holy is all about. We're going to talk about holiness. Y'all know some folk like that. Say holy, holy, then cuss you out on the bus. We're going to talk about what holiness is about for the next couple of weeks. Galatians 5, verse 25. Um, with all my able stand now for the reading of God's holy word. And as is our custom, please repeat after me. This is, this is the, word of God. the word of God. It has, it has transformative, power. transformative power. I will praise God. For this preaching moment. And I declare. That after this moment. That I shall never. Ever. Be the same. God be praised. Galatians 5 verse 25. This very simple seemingly phrase. Is faithfully recorded in the New Revised Standard Version. If we live by the Spirit. Let us also. Be guided. By. The Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of His Word for the dedication of our hearts and our souls. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to talk today for a few moments from the subject living by and guided by living by and guided by let us bow our heads for a word of prayer dear Lord we thank you for today we thank you for each and every one under the sound of my voice we more would thank you, God, for those that desired to be here but could not be here. We thank you for the gifts of the Spirit that we have already experienced. For you touching the hearts of your people, that they may sing resounding tunes, give resounding prayers to the goodness of you. Now, Lord, touch the words of my mouth. Let them not be my own understanding nor my opinion. But Lord, let them fall fresh from you, that someone may be transformed by the renewing of their mind. This indeed is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to slow it down a little bit today and take the time, unless the Lord says differently just to kind of talk to you about some life practicality. Over the past few weeks, we've been studying in Bible class, which was kicked off by Sister Cooper, talking about sin, and then later into the fruits of the Spirit, which ultimately leads us into a discussion about what it is to be holy. So we're going to paraphrase some of the Bible class discussion and really talk today about this notion of living by and being guided by. Galatians 5, which is read in your hearing, is, is not famous for verse 25. It is 
more famous for the three verses that are the precursors to verse 25 where we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. It is also known, secondly, to the fruits of the Spirit for its discussion, Paul's discussion of the works of the flesh. But really, when you read Galatians 5 in its totality, see, that's why it's important that we not read Scripture just for one verse or, or one thing that suits our fancy, but that's why it is important that we understand the whole context of what is being discussed. And so in Galatians 5, Paul is actually expounding on Jesus' love motif and is further moving us from a faith of do's and don'ts into a faith that requires us to live life by guiding principles and values. Uh, you see, the Old Testament church, after uh, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, had the Ten Commandments. And fancy individuals called the Ten Commandments the Decalogue. And as they came, as he came down with the Ten Commandments, it was very important for them to do this and do that. Not do this and not do that. But as time began to move on, we find that it became difficult. Uh, difficult to achieve the standards of the Decalogue. Because no matter how much you try in life, you're going to need a little bit of grace. Uh, um, there's nobody in here that is perfect, that gets it right all of the time. And so our Old Testament shows us that the, the history of man over and over again trying to get it right. And when man could not get it right, uh, that's when God gave his only begotten son. Uh, through God's grace that we might be saved and delivered. And so Jesus comes, and part of the tension with Jesus is Jesus is not getting rid of the do's and don'ts, but he's giving us a new way to look at the do's and don'ts. He is giving us first a commandment of love. He is giving us a principle by which to live by. You see, if you love, you won't take your neighbor's wife. Uh, if you love, you won't steal. Now, if you love, you honor your mother and your father. Instead of do's and don'ts, principles should be the guiding light for our lives. The way you can tell an organization or a mind that is soon to decay is that they'll jump to right away, do this and do that. But do this and do that does not leave room for you to think. It does not leave room for you to imagine the presence of God in your life. And so instead of do this and do that, what we should have are guiding principles that guide us to do right, even when right appears to be wrong. So here Paul is capitalized on Jesus' basic principle of love. And giving us, if you will, not only love, but some sections of the faith that would represent love and goodness. I want you to understand today, we've got to move our minds into a different direction. We've got to move our minds into principles and values that guide our life. You want to know what's wrong with the world today? There are no more principles and values. There is a collective conglomerate of principles and values that has nothing to do with the church. And therefore, we see the erosion of our very minds. Paul, as he's laying out for us, guiding principles of Christians. He first, this is what I like about Paul, he first begins with what the principles are not. And he calls these principles 
the work of the flesh. See, in order to define what your life principles are, you have to first define what they are not. So there will be no confusion in how you coordinate your life. So he uses this fancy phrase, the works of the flesh. Now somebody's sitting here saying, what is the works of the flesh? Jesus works of the flesh simply is doing what you want to do whenever right. you want to do. Right. Works of the flesh is deciding what you want to do. Having a dream last night and waking up and blaming it on the Lord. That's the works of the flesh. Works of the flesh cause some of us to have simple phrases like, well, I'm a child of God, but I just got to take the time to tell you how I feel. That's the work of the flesh. The work of the flesh says, excuse me, the very kind voice, but then gives the rudest sentiments to our brothers and sisters that you could ever Words of flesh, that thing that you just can't hold your peace about. You shaking and trembling about. Words of flesh, that, that thing that you're chasing after that you don't have no business chasing after. This is PG 13 version. I mean, you got a taste for it, but ain't never done you no good, done you no right. That thing that you carry the match in your purse for it ain't got no candles. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about it ain't addictive. That's the works of the flesh. Works of the flesh. That thing that you're running after trying to keep up with the Joneses got $2 in your pocket but got a $2,000 credit line and finding yourself in a negative $1,998. Because you've told yourself, I just have to have. Y'all might not shout today, but, but y'all know what I'm talking about. I, I owe it to myself. Laying and keeping yourself up at night. Watching the call waiting because you know that the credit card company is on the line. Taking the phone out the wall. That's the work. I think somebody's with me this morning. But here, Paul gives us in about verses 19 through 21, of which we all won't, we won't discuss all of them today, about what these works of the flesh are. Because if we're going to live again by principles, we got to know what the principles are. I'm not. Fornication. All over TV. Saying it's all right. Impurity. Not only sexual impurity, but you know what? We got to take better care of our bodies. You me and you. We have to make sure that we try to eat the best in that way that we can. Yeah, we Sister Tillman, I don't think I'm going to get away from chocolate cake all the way. And I don't think I'm going to get my Harold's chicken card away. But I don't need to eat it all the time. Yes. <laughs> Working out. Amen. Being conscious of our health. Because those are impurities that we put in our bodies that lead to what? Death. Impurity. Yes, yes, I'm going to go over just a couple that are oftentimes difficult to understand. Licentiousness. That's a disregard for the rules and constraints of society. Folk that want to play by their own rules, their own games. You may be saying, I'm not a crook. I'm not a crook. This doesn't, this doesn't lead to me. But can I break something down very simple for you to think that gets on, on my nerves? This is, as Paul would say, this is hunt talking now. 
If there's a line, you ought to get in your place in the line. You ought not want to cut in front of the line. If there are goods that are being given out free, uh, you ought not devise a plan to get more of the free stuff of everybody else. See, sometimes we read the scripture and we look at the big thing. I'm not talking about going to jail. I'm talking about a spirit of being slick. That's what I'm talking about. Everybody in here got a spirit of being slick. When the guy come into the beauty shop or the barber shop and he's selling hidden figures on DVD, you being slick. Because that's not the rules of the land. You say that don't apply to me when you're still in music on the radio and streaming movies that you ain't got no AMC star card for. That's licentiousness. This type of it's right. Because this mentality of breaking the rules moving the rules, shifting the rules. It starts innocent and then it escalates. See, that's why it's important to know what it's not because you could be doing something that you don't even know is wrong but it's just become a part of who you are. You just can't help it. Somebody says on sale, you want to find a man in the back with the van that got them Jordans for a little bit cheaper. Like yes, yes. Disregard for the rules. That don't apply to me. And the constraints. Not only in the simple rule sex, but in the, the sexual sex. The irresponsibility that comes with an inappropriate sexual acts. It don't apply to me. That had never happened to me. There are a lot of people in hospital wards with HIV because they said it would never, ever happen to me. Licentiousness. Here's another one that means that oftentimes we don't understand what it is when it's real. Enmities. Enmities. How do you know how what does that mean? Well, when you really look at it, it sort of says enemy. And what it means is the work of the flesh is hatred. Woo. Some of us hate and dislike folk we don't even know. We, we just didn't like the way somebody stood. I done governed many church discussions. Almost sitting around. I didn't like the way he looked at me. Is right. Hate on what somebody else has. The jealousy is one of those works of the flesh too. Living in the spirit of hatred. Guess what? If everybody knew in your life has a problem, you probably the one with the problem. Because when we work in the flesh, and we see this going on in our country now, we're going to talk about it later. Sometimes we don't like a person because we have just decided we ain't going to like that person. And let me tell you, if you got people in your life that don't like you, understand that it ain't necessarily because of you. They just can't help it. Look at your neighbor and say, they just can't help it. So it's just hateful. Always want to spin that anger. Even after things have been done according to the rule, they still decide, I'm going to hate. Next one. Work of the flesh. Strife. What's strife? Fighting and arguing all the time. You know, some folks just 
just like to fight and argue all the time. I don't usually do this too much in service, but look at your neighbor and say, he might be talking about you. <laughs> now watch this. Because the, the spirit, the one of the flesh that's fighting and arguing all the time, usually that spirit says, I hate fighting. But it loves fighting. To think it doesn't like the state that it is in. That's the work of the flesh. That's why I like the words of the hymn. If I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle, then the victory shall be mine. I wish God's people stopped arguing and fighting with folk that don't make no difference in your life anyway. Guess what? They'll hate you today. They hated you last night. And you still woke up this morning. Just hold your peace and let the Lord fight your back. Work of the flesh. Runs out to the playground and puts some Vaseline on the face. Because somebody said your mom is ready to fight. Work of the flesh. There are other works of the flesh. Jealousy. Anger. Quarrels. Many of these are interrelated. Dissension. If you got an organization, family, business, that is so fragmented all the time, that you need to address the problem then it is not working off biblical principles, yes, yes. factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. What's carousing? Carousing is an extension of drunkenness. It's the excess of drinking and having fun with others. In other words, family being on Stony Island is your second address. <laughs> same shouting. Not the same, but the loudness of the shouting you did here was the same loudness you did last night with a couple of shots. <laughs> a congat. Where you smacking your neighbor five times in here. Talking them here, saying carousing and having fun. See, we we can we can. It's all right. I got one the type of pastor. Don't mind you having fun. I I'll shake a leg in a minute. But when having fun becomes the only essence of your life, then everything poignant in your life will begin to fall. If you got babies and you going out to the dating game, see there's two clubs on the Stony Island. <laughs> and you going to the dating game and you leaving your babies at home by themselves, then you doing too much carousing. The essence of what God has for you cannot grow. The relationships that God wants to build in you cannot grow. You got to be careful about excessiveness. And as I looked at this text, you know, Sister Tillman, some people carouse too much around the church. They just here to have fun. They just here to be with their friends and miss the development of their character that needs to be distributed outside of here. In here ought to develop you to be better out there. You ought to be able to relate to more groups of people by this experience than the excluded people because of this experience. 
Some people have traded in the pew, the bar stool for a pew. There's a difference between living by the Spirit and being guided by the Spirit. I told you, I might shout three weeks from now because I don't think y'all going to shout next week. Now. According, now let's talk about what it is. We, we spent a lot of time, a few moments on what it is now. According to Paul, the Christian life ought to lead and yield the following fruits. Love. Not this, I love you this Sunday. You made me mad Wednesday. Now I just really can't stand you no more. Unconditional love. Love because God loves. If you can't love somebody because they get on your nerves, then you ought to love them because God loves them. And if God loves them and, and God takes the time to love us and our raggediness, who are we to turn up our nose at somebody else's raggediness? Love. That's what joy is, living in the state of happiness. Yeah. That means when I don't have nothing, I still got joy. Yeah. Yeah. That means when friends come and go, which they will, I still have joy. Yeah. Yeah. In the midst of a crowd of pews or just a few folk, I still yeah. have joy. Yeah. In the midst of my individual successes, I still have joy even in the midst of my failures. Yeah. Peace. Patience. See, many of the things that are the work of the flesh come when we don't have patience, right? right. We want what we want it right yeah. now. We don't want to wait. We want it right now. Yeah. Kindness. Yes. Yes. Got to be kind. Yes. Generosity. Yes. Faithfulness. Yes. Gentleness. Yes. Self-control. As I read this text, I'm almost through. And I see the challenges. I know all of y'all going to heaven, but it's hard for me sometimes. Because <laughs> this work of the flesh thing and fruit of the spirit, they are constant. Sometimes I'll be wanting to tighten my belt and give folk a piece of my mind. I don't know if I always remember if I hold my peace, let the Lord fight my battle. Sometimes I, I see things that, that violate my spirit, they violate who I am, and I'm a sense of arrogance, I want to get, get angry because it violates who I am. And so these things, if you're real about it, but if you if you go on to heaven, let's go and call Lee to come pick you up right now. <laughs> But most of the time when there's conflict in your life, it's not because of the person you're mad at. This is an internal struggle. You determined to be angry. You determined to be hateful. Nobody made you be hateful. You determined to give that person peace of your mind. And so it's very, it's very difficult because the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, if you're just honest with yourself, are always back. Because the folk around you waiting for you to go into the work of the flesh so they can quote, yeah, she go to church every Sunday. Look at her. Now they ain't been to church the first. But they quote the Bible. Those things are in constant contention. And so, only when we read this in Bible class did it dawn on me how brilliant Paul is. Verse 25 gives us the remedy to resolving this tension. Verse 25 specifically says to us, if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. So Paul gives us what it is not 
gives us what it is, and then gives us instruction that if we live by the Spirit, we also must be guided by the Spirit. Let's look at the text very closely. Paul is making a clear distinction between living by the Spirit and guided by the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you. When I read that in close range for the first time, I want to know how can you live in something but not be guided by it? Well, that makes sense to y'all? Yeah. When you read it. Now, when you have a mind of do's and don'ts, somebody told you. But when you read it, I'm grappling with how can I live in something and not be guided? The text is clear. It uses the conjunction but. But, yeah, but, that's right. It says, so it makes it clear that if we live in, we got to do something else. We got to be guided by. So it is possible for us to live lives. And see, this is, this is what we're going to get to today, these, these conflicts that we have in our spirit. We're going to keep having them. But I'm trying to teach you today how to know them when you see them. How to handle them when they come upon you. So it is possible to live by the Spirit, but not be guided by the same. We say yes to God and experience the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, but we overlook the fact that life is a continuum of growing and renewal of the divine relationship we have with God. So yes, when you give God your life, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You've made Jesus your choice, but you can't stop there. You can't stop there even five years later, ten years later. It's a constant ongoing of asking for direction of the Holy Spirit in your life. Saying, what shall I do? Where shall I go? We can live by it. But life is lived in the combination of living by and being guided by. You can live and experience the Holy Spirit, but is the Holy Spirit what you use to think about how you live your daily life? Do you understand that to be, how many of us are Christians in here? All right. If you're a Christian, then you are living in the state of Christ. That means the principles of Christ are with you 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. The guiding principles of your life are indeed what we discussed. The guiding principles of your life are love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control And so when we live lives that end up in an end result opposite of any of these fruits, then our living begins to be in vain. If we run into church every Sunday, but we still got a whole bunch of hate in our hearts, if we can't embrace the new person that comes through the door at our job or our work or our schools or wherever it may be and show some patience and peace with folks, then we are not living by the guiding principle. Yes, yes. I'm going to leave you today on two guiding principles, two ways to kind of address this in your life, ways to think about this. I wish, I watched, did y'all see the episode of Blackish this week? Go on, look at it when you get home. Uh, the son was at school and he began to recite, I have a dream. It was a very controversial episode, much of which I did not agree with. I'm tired of the media.
point in black folks, all of us don't think the same way about everything. But that's another sidebar. I remember having a discussion with, with China and saying, I have a dream speech and I think it's one of the most magnificent speeches ever given, but I wish we would not cheapen Dr. King to one speech. We need to be hearing some why we can't wait right now. We need to be hearing things, some of the things that are going to cause us to even more action beyond I have a dream. We've been sleeping long enough. I'm talking about a dream. There ain't no problem with him in the dream, but it's our mentality. There's one thing about, one, one thing that we found in this church on of Dr. King's philosophy that to me is more pointed than I have a dream. And we're going to do one more next week. That is this notion that the ends must pre-exist in the means. He said, what does that mean? If my end result is love, then this love has got to get me there. If my end result is joy, then it's joy that's got to get me there. Hate can't get me to love. Ignorance can't get me to joy. If it's patience that I need, then patience got to get me there. Not being in a hurry. Getting in a hurry can't bring me to patience. And so when we even look at the biblical principles of Christ, he, and, the, and the principles that Paul later expounds on, what he's saying is the ends have to pre-exist in the means. So if I want happiness in my life, I've got to live happiness. If I want hatred out of my life, I can't be so hateful of people. If I want tolerance of me in my life, I have to be more tolerant and loving of other people in my life. The ends must pre-exist. Those are guiding principles. So you want to know why hell, why you never spent experiencing love in your life? Because love ain't present at your doorstep. Why for generations you ain't been able to have peace in your family? Because peace ain't a part of how you do things. The first thing everybody want to do is shoot up and turn up. And so shoot up and turn up will not get you to peace. Why you can't make your hands with me? Because you're stingy. <laughs> want to take everything from everybody, but I don't never want to give nothing. And wonder why you ain't got nothing? Because your hand is closed. And can't nothing get in a closed hand. If you want generosity in your life, you got to be generous to somebody else. I, I know you might not shout this morning, but, but these are principles of life. all day then go and you'll have a pity party. I wish somebody loved me when you don't love nobody. <laughs> so if we, in other words, if we're going to live by the Spirit, then we have to be guided by the principles of the Spirit. Just, just you don't even have to raise your hand. Just think about the last time you went off your rock. Some of us, it might have been like five seconds ago. <laughs> The last time you went off your rocker is because these things, this thought pattern was not interactive. Because you were tr probably trying to get somebody to do something, and it might have even been the right thing. But you were going about it the wrong way. You got to go about it the right way. Ends must pre exist in the, mean, in the means. For example, this country, one nation. Under God. Yes. Indivisible with liberty, justice, and all. Yes. Yes. We have the inalienable rights. Yes. Life, liberty, yes. and a pursuit of happiness. Yes. Sounds good. Yes. We recited in first grade. Yes. We live in with it. But we ain't be guided by it. Because when the animal likes a life limited in the pursuit of happiness, and I will not be afraid when I drive to Rosewood with my bull's hat to my back and my Morehouse sweatshirt on, I will not be afraid that I'm going to be pulled over and shot to death. And the reason why I'm afraid, well, I ain't really afraid, y'all know me, but y'all know what I'm saying. The reason why I'm concerned 
is because we live in a world that lives with, but not guided by. While there's economic despair, the haves and the have-nots, because we live with, but we're not guided by. The ends must pre-exist in the means. Secondly, I want us to consider when we look at the guiding principles that God has for us. And I'm going to send the letter, Sister Tillman, that went to Congressman John Lewis out this week. But we got to be careful when we live by principles that when things don't go our way, and for not everybody in here, you'd be surprised, but but some of us in here, when Hillary Clinton does not become the President of the United States, in the ends are going to pre-exist in the means, we must be guided by a principle of love. A principle of I would not take nothing for my journey now. A principle that says justice yet reigns in the midst of a Republican and in the midst of a Democrat. Justice yet reigns in the midst of the red, the black, the brown, and the white. That justice yet reigns. Now there's some that thought it was a bright idea to boycott the inauguration. Boycott, yes, because they may have been dissed. I'm not debating that. I'm not here to debate that. They might have felt bad, but I want you to watch how the ends must pre-exist in the me. If power is at the table, yes. you can't boycott the table. Come on, if reconciliation is at the table, Come on, then you gotta chuck your ego in. Anybody here ever done that? You gotta chuck your ego in for the greater good and the movement of the people. Because guess what? If I got it and you don't have it. Boycott the table all you want, then you just won't get it. When your ego is so great that if I have a feast and you got bologna sandwiches and you decided that you're not going to come to my house, you're the one stuck with the bologna sandwiches.
sit at the table of your enemy and your enemy been talking about you all night long, trying to break you up, despairing your name. We have to live by and be guided by it. What is this ultimately? I'll give you several scenarios today. I'm going to leave you with the final scenario for this living by and guided by. The greatest example of living by and guided by that can be reflective of our lives is our very homes right now. Anybody here ever been a child? Yeah. Anybody here been a parent? Yeah. Most of us here fall in that category. Either All of us really either child or God or, or we parents. This whole notion of living by and being guided by can be seen in our homes. When you were a child, you knew and ran into conflict if you actually violated this principle. Uh, let me use Shannon as an example, because Drew is here today. I don't know if Drew to feel like I'm talking about her. <laughs> and it is probably more for Shannon when Shannon was in high school. Shannon lived in my house. Shannon understood that it was daddy's house. Much like the spirit, Shannon lived in it and she understood the power of it. She understood that the lights didn't just pop on by osmosis. Somebody was sustaining her so that she could see what she did on homework. Um, she understood that food didn't just miraculously pop up in the freezer or the refrigerator and, and close, although children seem to think that sometimes, didn't miraculously fall on her shoulders with various name brands. Uh, she understood when she got her car. When she got her car, she was happy, and she came home with the keys to her new car. She understood this conversation that was had. I'm glad that you have a car, baby, but I want you to understand this is my car that I allow you to drive. So she understood that she lived by Andrew and China. It was in that that she lived, she moved, and she had a baby. And so all of that is in balance, the fact that she understood that. But the moment that she violated guiding principles is when we're going to have a problem. See, you're living in my house, but you got to be guided by my principles. So my principles say uh, that you got to be in the house by one o'clock in the morning. You are now violating the principle if you're coming in at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, my principles say that there's a way you ought to carry yourself. That I know what you're listening to when I'm not around. And ain't nothing that I can do about what you listen to when I'm not around. But I declare when my garage door goes up and my foot hits the door, the radio version better be playing because there is not you living by. You're living by what I have, but you got to be guided by some principles. And so what all of us have found, whether it was our parents, whether it was us, we find ourselves in conflict when we were children, conflicts with our children, when even 